is anything we do, we do by solving problems. And what I'm essentially going to suggest here is what one of the biggest problems or some of the biggest problems that we face uh, are and essentially what essentially could happen to us if we don't solve them and essentially what could happen if we do. And that's, that's getting access to the whole universe. Now, this image you see behind me over here, that is uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's supposed to be a picture of the whole universe. It's supposed to be a picture of the entire universe. Now, that's as much of the universe as we can see. And by the way, that's not even all of the picture. I couldn't even fit it on the slide. Now, think about it this way. The universe is constantly expanding. Right? People call it infinite. How do we as a civilization or our descendants thousands or millions of years from now get access to every single bit of the universe? The definition of hacking, like the textbook definition, is solving problems to gain access into something. The core of this talk also is the idea of solving very certain problems that we might face. Uh, and while there's certain parts of this, again, we're looking so far into the future, there's certain parts of this that are based on what some scientists have thought of. We're going to have like some Soviet scientists. Uh, you're gonna get, basically, you're going to get a guy confused for Kardashian. You're going to get uh, Drake, not, not, not Champagne Puppy on Instagram. Uh, and you're also going to get a couple of ideas as to what happens to these advanced civilizations. But at the end of the day, where the goal of this talk is to inspire everyone here to think about how we can gain access to something that's infinite, to control something that's infinite. Now, when you're trying to hack the whole universe, you're going to have to look at a couple of numbers. Now, this is not, th these are not, uh, you wouldn't call these you know, scientific theories that uh, we apply today in what we do, because these are, these are far-fetched. I'm going to start with the first one here, the first little box we have going on here. So as you can see, it's like type 1 to type 3. Anyone, anyone kind of familiar where I'm going with this? Anyone heard of a Soviet scientist by the name of Nikolai Kardashev? Nikolai Kardashev, anyone? No, okay, fair enough. He's, he's you know, the, the space race was some time ago. Now, Nikolai Kardashev is a very interesting fellow, okay? He likes to think. He likes to think about things, things that we probably wouldn't imagine on our own. You know, at that time, we were sending dogs to space and we had like a tiny little metal ball we called the Sputnik in space, right? And this guy, Nikolai Kardashev, decides to come up with a scale for what space civilizations are going to be. So this guy is like the, imagine Elon Musk times a billion, you know, living during the Cold War. He's, he's basically a genius. And he starts talking about what civilizations might look like if they become super advanced. So he comes up with this scale. It starts with type 1. Type 1 is a civilization that basically can harness all of the energy from a planet. We're not even there yet, by the way. We haven't even managed to harness all of the energy from Earth. We're, we're closer to like a type 0 0.9, somewhere around there, but we're not even a type 1 yet. And that's important because if we want to hack the whole universe, we have to go way further than that. Now, this is on a planetary scale. Type 2. Let's move away from planets. Let's go up a bit. Let's, uh, let's get into the big leagues. Now, in type 2, we want a civilization that can control the energy from a star. How would that work? Now, because this Kardashev guy is so crazy, um, a lot of people were inspired by him. Other crazy fellows like me who go around looking like, hey, that guy's, that guy's got some cool ideas. Uh, they write science fiction books, and they try to use this scale that Kardashev came up with to try and come up with you know, these ideas for their science fiction. And one of them, some of you might have heard something called a Dyson Sphere. Anyone heard of, of a Dyson Sphere? Yeah. We've got a couple of folks who know what a Dyson Sphere is. Now, Okay, let's think of it. Think of a Dyson sphere as a sphere as a 3D array of uh, satellites. Tiny little, maybe not that tiny, but satellites that basically orbit a star. Imagine if we built a Dyson sphere around our sun, we'd essentially have a bunch of satellites going around the sun. And what these satellites do is they basically collect energy. Imagine sol like solar panels right in front of the sun, leaking the very flames of our star collecting energy in that manner. Imagine how, how much energy they could collect. Putting a solar panel here on Earth can already power a lot of our systems. Imagine these solar panels in front of the sun itself. Now, these advanced civilizations have theoretically, in a lot of these science fiction books, built these Dyson spheres to achieve what Kardashev came up with in type 2, which is harnessing all the energy from a star. Now, you can sort of see where I'm going with this harnessing energy and increasing planetary scale. If we want to hack the whole universe, we've got to know what that's going to look like, what basically would mean, what the definition of a universal civilization is going to be. So I'm going to climb up that scale one more time, and then I'm going to add a natural extension to it. So we've got type 3. Now, that's a galactic scale. Imagine a civilization that's able to control the entire Milky Way. 
Like imagine there's a giant black hole in the center of our, our galaxy and it is a civilization that's able to control the whole thing. That's pretty impressive and it's so impressive that even science fiction authors haven't managed to catch up to that yet. Some have. I'm not going to argue with the YouTube comments that are going to come in and say, no, I read this book, I read this book. No, no, it's done. But uh, I will say this. Uh, type 3 civilization essentially is an extension up forward where this civilization is able to control all the energy, harness all the energy from an entire galaxy. So if we want to hit the universe, what type comes after that? One, two, three, anyone? What's the next number? You guys know how to count, right? Type 4. And that's not on the Kardashev scale. Unfortunately, Kardashev wasn't as crazy as I am, and uh, no, not really. There are a couple of other scientists that are very crazy, and I think Kardashev is extremely crazy in a very good way. Um, but this extension has been basically, pro uh, basically uh, propagated by scientists who wanted to look a little bit further. Again, this is theoretical stuff. This is people thinking about what this might look like in the future. And among the thoughts that, they, that these people have had, is a type 4 civilization, one that is able to control an infinitely expanding amount of energy. Just imagine that, just think about that for a second. An infinitely expanding amount of energy, a universe that's constantly growing, and yet somehow there's this civilization, these bunch of space monkeys that have figured out some, some kind of way to control the whole thing, to run the whole show. That is by far the definition of a god, if there is any definition of a god that we can, we can think of in a somewhat of a scientific way, in somewhat of a structured way, more or less. If we look at a structured approach to what a god is, it would essentially be controlling everything that surrounds us, and everything that we know is the universe. So that's an incredible goal. Now, if that's what we want to do, how the heck do we get there? This is a, this is a problem. I mean, look, I wasn't gonna I, I wasn't gonna approach a very simple a simple uh, simple problem for my TEDx talk. I wanted to I want to do something a little bit interesting here, so that uh, well, I'll tell you why in a bit. But uh, I wanted to keep you guys interested, and I also wanted to give you guys a reason to, uh, in some cases, a reason to live. I'm not gonna lie, but uh, I want to keep you motivated. And beyond this. The Kardashev scale means, does give us uh, like a, a range of how these civilizations can be. Does that mean that we're the only ones out here? I mean, think about it. Okay, we've got type 1, type 2, type 3. These are, this is all a theory, stuff like that. But either way, there has to be some kind of civilization out there. We're not alone, right? 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 Anyone? Is there like an alien over there? No, we're good, we're good, no. But what I mean by this is essentially there's, th there's what, this, is the, this is the Drake equation. I'll just move straight into this, okay? Now, yeah, I'm not going to explain essentially how the Drake equation works. It's been used multiple times to come up with various estimations. But the Drake equation is basically, again, not that Drake, but the Drake equation is basically a way of identifying the number of radio communicative civilizations, not in the universe, that, that 100 million, 1,000 to 100 million value, that doesn't represent potential radio communicative uh, civilizations in the universe. That's just the Milky Way galaxy. That's just our local area. That's, that's basically just where we are. It's like our neighborhood. And of course, we, we're not able to travel from one end of the Milky Way yet, but uh, one end to the other yet. But if this is the number of potential advanced civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, something's up. Where the heck are all the aliens? Anyone? Exactly. I look behind. They're not there. So if you think about it, something's wrong. And that brings about a very interesting thing called the Fermi Paradox. Where the heck are the aliens? Which is basically what the Fermi Paradox is. They, did they die? Did, did they die? Did they kill themselves? Did, did they all get wiped out like the die? It's possible. Again, so the, the potential things that could have happened, they could have been wiped out by natural disasters. They could have been destroyed by another advanced civilization. Think Star Wars. Like, imagine like, a bunch of aliens basically destroying themselves. Um, or the most likely outcome is Unfortunately, <laughs> this. Anyone know what that is, that image at the back? Anyone recognize that? It's a, it's a mushroom cloud. It's not an ordinary mushroom cloud. Most mushroom clouds are tested and wind up, you know, basically blowing up a bunch of rocks somewhere. This one killed people. This was dropped on a Japanese city called Nagasaki in World War II. And it's a prime example of what happens when civilizations try to destroy themselves. Now, the reason why I'm, sorry, I'm giving you this depressing news is, you can see over there there's an icon of a filter. There's another theory that sort of ends this entire theoretical discussion. And that is the theory of the great filter. That all advanced civilizations at some point find a way to destroy themselves. 
Now, even though at the end of World War II, we came up with the UN and we came up with international institutions to try to prevent this kind of thing, there's still people right now in the world who are concerned about nuclear war. You know, fairly recently, there were people in Hawaii that got a text message saying that a nuclear attack is imminent, seek shelter immediately. That wasn't 1947, 1945. That wasn't just after World War II or just during World War II. That was just a few years ago. So I, I get it. Yes, the likelihood of us being struck by a nuclear weapon isn't as high as it was before. It's true. We've done a little bit better for ourselves. I mean, if anything, we millennials like to complain a bit, right? But we can thank the previous generations for at least sorting out some of their problems. Some. Make sure, remember I said some, okay? <laughs> now, the only problem here is that's not the only thing that we could destroy us. Yes, we might have more or less saved ourselves from a nuclear war. We're still kind of teetering in dangerous territory. I'm not going to lie. But we're slowly killing ourselves in another way. I'm sure all of you, or most of you, and I'm pretty sure all of you, are aware of the fact that we're slowly choking our planet. I don't want to sound like Al Gore over here. I don't want to be the uh, climate guy for everyone, but I think there is some attention that we need to pay to the fact that we are not only destroying ourselves by incredible weaponry, that's not just it. We're destroying the only planet we live on. What kind of civilization? Think about it. Just try to, try to escape the Earth, get on a rocket, get off Earth, and think, if you were watching the Earth from another planet, and you saw these, these, these monkey-like creatures going around basically setting fire to their own planet, polluting the planet to the point where they basically can't live there anymore, and are not having any option to move anywhere else. Again, I said this in my last TED talk, I'll say it's a TEDx talk, I'll say that again. Elon Musk has not got us to Mars yet. If we do not do something now, we're going to potentially destroy the very planet that we live on before we can get anywhere else. And as a single planetary civilization, that is the surefire way of making sure we don't make it to becoming a universal civilization. So remember when I said, I'm going to help you find the problem? You're looking at it. That's the problem. Now, I didn't promise a solution. I didn't promise a solution. But I'm a hackathon hacker. And what a hackathon hacker is, is someone who sits in a 24-hour programming competition. You have a deadline. You have a time limit. And in that time limit, you're essentially trying to solve your problems. And that's important to think about. Because our clock is ticking. How many of you have heard of the doomsday clock? I know I'm telling you the sky is falling. I'm telling you like everything's going downhill. but Look, scientists came up with the doomsday clock because they were concerned we would do something like this to ourselves. We do have some people thinking about how we can prevent ourselves from destroying ourselves. There are people thinking about it. But the problem that we have is not all of us are. How many of you have actually, when, when, you, when someone tells you to, to when, you, when you're told to pay 20 cents to buy a plastic bag, how many of you actually think you're playing a part in saving the world? I, honest, hands up. Anyone honestly feel like they're saving the world? No. Not one hand. I don't see a single hand. I, mean, I could be blinded a bit by the lights. No. Not a single hand. And how many of you feel that it's just a minor inconvenience? I'll pay the 20 cents and I'll pick up a plastic bag. Okay, none of you? Okay, that's interesting. Look, okay, I'll put it this way. We don't think as much about these small things that we do to try to quote-unquote save the planet. It becomes very repetitive and we get very scared. We're like, oh, you know, everyone's talking about how to save the planet. You know, I honestly think these guys are just on about something and we're not going to actually wind up destroying ourselves. Well, there's a catch. In a hackathon, you have a time limit. At a certain time, you end coding. You stop. You stop working on your solution and you're done. I've given you the problem and here's, the, here's what we have to look at. How much time we have to get to the solution. Okay, so again, hacking the universe is a topic that sends you thousands to millions of years in the future, okay? And for us to get to that point, we have to survive that long. The picture behind me is a picture of five astronauts hanging around in the Panama, around the Panama Canal. Uh, the man you see over there, uh, there's this guy over here, he's, 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 he's not dabbing, I don't think he's dabbing. Uh, his name is Neil Armstrong. He was the first man to walk on the moon. And Neil Armstrong is hanging out over here with his buddies uh, in the, in the pa around the Panama Canal, basically trying to figure out how to survive. Why is that? Why is he trying to figure out how to survive? 
This guy is going to the moon. What's he doing in the jungle? So I'll have to explain a bit here. When astronauts prepare for their training, when they go for the training for basically go to space, they're basically prepared for an emergency landing or crash landing somewhere where the recon team, mission control, is going to take some time to go find them. And these guys over here, they're essentially preparing for a scenario where they're going to wind up somewhere. They're going to have to wait for a very long time to be found. And for them, they need to survive. The clock is ticking for them too, and they need to survive. All these people right here, before they walked on the moon, they had to figure out how to survive on Earth. So what I'm telling all of you today, to summarize, to keep it, to keep it brief, is that yes, we have problems, big problems. We could destroy ourselves. But if we want to get to the solution, we better well be prepared to survive. Don't try to be a god. If you want to hack the universe, you know, you don't have to be a Roman or Greek god that controls the wind or controls thunder or whatever it is. You've got to be a cockroach. You have to be a cockroach. Survive as long as you can. Or you could be the human and prevent the nuclear war altogether. The cockroach can tunnel away and survive a nuclear blast. The humans, we can think. And modern problems require modern solutions. Thank you, everybody.